I show it's top of the hour. We have a few people still coming in. Hello, everybody. It's good to see everyone arriving over in the participant aisle. I love it. Um, while we're getting settled, um, we have a message from our sponsor, Glass Tires. So we thought we would go ahead and run that uh, video and then we'll start just after, after that. Thank you to Glass Tire for um, supporting us, supporting this program, and to all of you for joining us tonight and showing your support by being here. I'm Terry Thornton, Curator of uh, Education at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. Uh, welcome to being there, Tuesday Evenings with the Modern, the museum's online alternative um, to the long-running lecture series, Tuesday Evenings at the Modern. Um, each week for this special program, a guest curator, someone who has participated in the Tuesday evening program in the past, uh, invites an exciting talent within the art world to give um, that evening's presentation. This is followed by a Q&A generated by you. So um, as the presentation proceeds, you can uh, type your questions by um, accessing Zoom's Q&A tab down at the bottom. And in the end, um, the speaker will entertain as many questions as time allows. Tonight's curator or guest curator um, is uh, the artist Stanley Whitney, whose work was featured in the museum's 2017 focus, Stanley Whitney. It is Stanley um, we have to thank for inviting Tony uh, Sarderni Vigna, uh, director and partner of Gallery Nordenhock in Mexico City to give tonight's presentation. Um, while Stanley um, is unable to join us tonight, he wanted me to pass on this introduction for Tony. So I'm going to read um, Stanley's introduction. Quote, I met Tony Sederni a few years ago when I had a show at Gallery Nordenhock in uh, Berlin. Tony was working at the gallery at the time. He struck me as a smart and ambitious young curator with a clear passion for art history. Recently, Tony oversaw the opening of Gallery Nordenhock in Hawk's um, Mexico City location, and he now serves as the director of the space. I've been very impressed with the work he's doing in Mexico. I nominated him for tonight's talk so that he can share with you his experience establishing the gallery space and his work to build connections between the gallery's artists and Mexico City. We thank Stanley Whitney um, for that. And um, having taken a peek, I know that Tony has uh, an amazing presentation for us tonight, featuring some of my personal favorites while also introducing work that's brand new to me. So all very exciting. Stanley Whitney um, has good reason to be impressed with Tony Sidarni, and um, it's our good fortune to have um, him here tonight. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to you, Tony. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you for the invitation, Terry, and Stanley also. Uh, I wanted to, yeah, my main purpose would be to introduce the dialogue that we have tried to establish in Mexico City between like, uh, a, you know, an old contemporary art European gallery and the, the very special 
and uh, complex context here and very rich, of course. So the Gallery Northern Haki started in the late 70s in Stockholm, in uh, Sweden. And it was like very uh, renowned, and it is very renowned to, to introduce like minimalist, post-minimalist, monochromatic American artists to European audiences, to Scandinavia and further, such as uh, Robert Ryman, Richard Serra, Amasha Hafif, and so on, as well as introducing uh, Scandinavian artists to international audiences. So I was working at the gallery in Berlin, as mentioned before, and was fascinated by Mexico and decided to partner with Class Northern Hockey and open a space in Mexico. Actually, one of the works that most struck me when I first came to Mexico was this work that you're seeing of Matias Geritz. It's called uh, Espacio Escultorico. And it's maybe like his most, uh, his biggest work for sure, is one of his most important works in the context of Mexico City in the public space. He's uh, an artist from Germany related to the Bauhaus that uh, moved to Mexico City and is part of this uh, group of artists that throughout the 20th century and before like developed a dialogue, like a lifelong, strong, uh, radical dialogue with the, with the context of Mexico City and Latin America at large. And actually this work uh, that is like uh, this circle relates of course to land art, but especially to the volcanoes of Mexico City that kind of define the valley of Mexico. Actually there's one that is active still nowadays and you can see the volcanic rock in, amidst the, um, the work. And Klaas Northern Haki met uh, Matthias Gerrits in the 80s when he was visiting regularly uh, the country and it still uh, stays in his mind as something that was uh, truly like uh, touching, so to say. So I wanted to start with this work to also connect a little bit with the history before we move on to the, to the areas that we've introduced in Mexico. Next, please. So here you see how the, the interior of the, of the work is actually volcanic stone from which you can see the, the city at the end. So there's this connection between like the valley and the city and, uh, and your viewer experience. So it's like a, a, a strong work in the context. Next, please. So actually the first uh, show that uh, I decided to do in the gallery in Mexico was based in this book by a French philosopher, Quentin Meyassou, called After Finitude, an essay on the necessity of contingency. And I invited Peruvian artist, Elena Damiani to uh, enter in, into like a di dialogue with the, with the book and to invite artists from the, from the gallery's table to like produce like uh, a show that would connect like the, the context, like the, the historical context with the, of the gallery with new works by herself. Uh, next up, please. So the work is, uh, talks about the, that the only like, um, kind of like certainty that we have nowadays is like the abs that absolute chaos or absolute contingency as of a meteorite impacting the earth as it happened in the past or like uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, or also nothingness. This will also be part of this absolute chaos, absolute contingency. So he's talking a lot about this notion of infinity and the artists and myself and mostly Elena Damiani from Peru selected works as this uh, 3D pie by uh, Swedish artist Eva Lofdal and also like the work that you see behind the wall that she produced. Like, next slide, please. So it was important to introduce the work of Anne Edholm, uh, a legendary, almost like Swedish abstract painter from the 80s that uh, in general has like very mystical connotations. And in this case, it relates to the Big Bang or in the Jewish Kabbalah, the Sim Tsum, or this origin of the universe starting with a point, so, so with a small, dot in, the, in nothingness. Next, please. And Elena Damiani decided to produce a new work with black marble from the north of Mexico, from Monterrey, because it's very special from this region. And it has this connection between different temporalities uh, in the universe, namely the production of stone and minerals and its, uh, and its all its lines and patterns and the universe, so to say. So we have these very slow temporalities of, the, of geological movements. 
and these very fast uh, temporalities of like comets or stars, for instance. And the work is kind of like this uh, staircase to upwards that could continue and endlessly. Uh, next, please. So the next uh, project we decided to show in the gallery was a, a solo show by Helen Mira, an artist based in uh, Sam, north of San Francisco, whose work is very related to both textile and text. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the show started with this like wall painting that we decided to translate to Spanish. And with this work, we started this translation project as it would be kind of metaphorical and a, and a symbolical gesture towards this notion of translation from one language or one culture to the other. So I would read in English what the, the poem or the text, which would be like rock, floor, blot, rock, mind, rock, floor, blanket, blot, blot, rock. The word glacier is like prototypical of her work and uh, it, many of the texts are kind of like the conceptual origin of like her textile works. Next, please. And I engaged in this like, um, now I'm maybe like, uh, I don't know if I'm like, if I would do it again, but I did this translation of her, uh, of nine years of, of poetry of hers, concrete poetry, conceptual poetry, very linked to like walking. And we translated it to Spanish. So we did this bilingual publication that was like uh, very important for me and for the gallery to be like beyond the, the context of the, of the exhibition space and be like in contemporary art bookstores, in museums and in the poetry context, so to say. Next, please. And here you can see some slides from the show where, where we were showing like her most iconic like textile works that I thought was were very important uh, and we always had the feeling that they resonate a lot with the Mexican context and the Latin American context because of the textile tradition that we have here like the the loom used by the artist nowadays kind of resembles the traditional pre-Hispanic or like from traditional mixtures of pre-Hispanic and colonial uh, Mexican looms for say, but, of, but of course they exist by themselves and they have another another connotation also. Next slide, please. So we were showing in this like uh, earlier, 20, earlier 20th century neo-Gothic uh, house in the center of Mexico City. And uh, it was, it was a, a space that had a lot of presence and the artists very quickly like decided to work with the space itself. And a very, like uh, another point that was one of my purposes was to invite artists in this, from other places to have a residency in Mexico City. I invited the artist June Crespo from Bilbao. I am myself from Barcelona, so I have a connection to Bilbao, to do a residency in the gallery. And she actually established uh, her like studio and in the garden, I decided to work with the architecture of the space. Um, she was mostly shocked by the, the traces of the, of the last earthquake in the city. And she like noticed that many of the buildings have like an empty space in between one building and the other. And it was, it's because of the movements created by the earthquakes. And some of the buildings are like crashing towards each other and some others are have like these empty spaces. Next slide, please. So the artist did a series of concrete cast sculptures that were like taking the empty space between the buildings. And the show was called Kinships and she would like kind of like understand or uh, feel her sculptures as they would be like these metaphors of like uh, the connection between human beings throughout time and, through, and kind of like relation to, related to houses or buildings throughout time in the city. So here in the right side of the sculpture, you can see the empty space between the gallery and the next building that she then combined with another cast of a bucket or something. And it's related to this tradition of like negative space, empty sculpture, emptiness or feelness in uh, 20th century sculpture. Next, please. So her work would also include uh, her own, uh, her own like clothes, parts of her own, uh, of her own like kind of like closet. So say here you can see like the casts of her shoes or her pullover or parts of the gallery building that she then 
cast it and uh, assembled together and real and related a lot to like uh, post Freudian or like psychoanalytic theory of the horizontal as being the the realm of night life and the vertical as being like daytime or something really related to philosopher Durand to the German to the French philosopher Durand. Next, please. It was very important for her to also include uh, uh, plants in her work. Like she was very interested in how the city is like kind of like a concrete jungle or some parts of the city have like a lot of like plants and also the garden of the gallery was part of this uh, ecosystem. And she included uh, plants in this case, flowers that you can see in the sculptures and throughout time they will disappear and they will leave a trace in the sculpture and, uh, and the work will have like a life by itself. And she will also like, in this case, cast like a radiator or something. But the, the work is called Kinship's Grandma. So there's this connection to also her own personal history. Next, please. So this is like actually my favorite work in which you can see like a cast of a, of a leaf, kind of like hugging or enveloping like a Mexican textiles. And also like a cast of like also again radiator and it's called like mother and daughter. So I say that they have this very rough quality also and they're like in this like horizontal level, really powerful, mysterious. Next please. And actually with, we wanted to really also uh, move beyond sculpture, painting, textile, so to say, and we invited the young Mexican artist Wendy Cabrera Rubio and Jose Mejia to produce a new project that was actually a performance or a multimedia a performance in which like two parrots, like were two caricatures of like uh, the architect, the Mexican architect, Pedro Ramirez Vázquez and a student. And they would have a very parodic, but critical like dialogue about Mexican modern architecture and the representation of Mexicanism and Mexican history and the pre-Hispanic identity in modern architecture and the problems related to that and to the notion of scale, mean, like miniature, and so on. Next, please. So you can see here, like the, the most important work of Pedro Ramirez Vázquez in the 60s, which is the Anthropology Museum, which is the most important museum of, for pre-Hispanic art in the world. And it's a very spectacular, but very problematic building that has this love, hate um, echo with younger critical artists, so to say. And the artist really made like a, a, a deep research with like the, the problems, especially with the notion of scale and how you replicate uh, like indigenous people in the museum in one-on-one, -on -one, like almost like wax museum, like, uh, like cottages or how, you rep or how you represent in modern architecture copies of uh, Mexican art, as you can see in the column, this like very famous umbrella of the museum. Next, please. Actually, for the next project, we that was one of the like most uh, deeply researched projectors of the gallery. Like we worked with Sarah Crowner, and the New York artists decided to work with um, the trees of uh, jacaranda trees from Mexico City that came in the city in the 30s with a, a Japanese gardener of the emperor dictator Porfirio Diaz, who decided to plant a lot of jacaranda trees uh, copying like the cherry blossom phenomena in Japan, but in Mexico City. And it's been a phenomenon that has been expanding throughout the, the 20th century in many new areas of the city. And even nowadays, there's still like new plantation projects of jacarandas that kind of paint the city purple once a year. So, next, please. So the artist did a body of work like paintings created with pieces of textile that she would sew together. Uh, like uh, based on the shapes and colors from the jacaranda trees, but also decided to really incorporate the trees inside the exhibition space, having this dialogue between the inside, the inside and the outside. Next, please. So all the paintings were like scattered throughout the gallery, as well as the baby jacaranda trees that we afterwards donated to like a, an, uh, an environmentalist NGO that is planting trees in the city in kind of, kind of like expanding the exhibition beyond the, the, the gallery time frame and kind of like further expanding this like painting uh, the city purple once a year, so to say, in 
collaboration with like agents in the city. So say next, please. So here you can see more like, uh, uh, like shots from the show, next. She even did like, a, she even did like also like shaped canvases, like in relation, like explicit in relation to like plinths for the trees. So there's like a constant correspondency between uh, the shapes of the works and the, and, the, and the natural world, so to say, in art history and architectural history, but also in several like botanical elements and urban histories. Next, please. Next, please. So there would be also moments of the of the exhibition where there would be only plants, so to say. Next, please. And also they would be connected to the to the city, so to say, through the like the, the windows. Next, please. For the project, we produced like an, uh, a second publication called also Post Sacaranda. Uh, with a with a cover uh, with a photograph from a Luis Barragan building that also kind of in his work quoted the Jacaranda trees as many other uh, architects and artists throughout Mexican 20th century art history. Next, please. And uh, after Sarah Crowner, we invited Peruvian artist Jose Vera Matos to do his first solo exhibition in Mexico City. And the artist uh, decided to produce a new body of work that would be not uh, be hanging in the gallery, but would be showed like almost in between, like anthropological museum between like uh, styles, so to say. Next, please. To even uh, render more visible or more explicit the the source of his artistic thinking, which is usually like the the complexities and the antagonisms between like a Western perspectives of like uh, pre-Hispanic uh, indigenous culture and its own meanings. The artist does these drawings by rewriting whole books. So these are like text uh, drawings, so to say that can actually be read. Next, please. But the patterns themselves come from, in this case, like uh, deriva derivative Inca textiles that are very common in Peru. And they're like almost unreadable. So she's doing this conceptual game of, of rewriting an unreadable book that represents uh, shapes produced for that are present in museums and in, in a world where people cannot read them anymore. And they're like a marginal object that is sometimes brought to the center, but it's unreadable. Next, please. So here you can see also the display and another plexi and bamboo work he did in the gallery space that we kept transforming with uh, new plywood walls or we would show the old walls and so on. Next, please. After uh, Jose Vera Matos, for us, it was uh, really exciting also and to show a new body of work uh, produced especially for the Mexican space by uh, American artist Spencer Finch. It was his first time in Mexico City, surprisingly for many American, for many US uh, citizens, it was the first time to be in Mexico or to in interact explicitly with Mexico. And the main work of the project by Spencer Finch is this like light in installation that replicates the light that the artist uh, captured under like the shade of an orange tree. And it actually, uh, refers to a poem by the Spanish poet Federico García Lorca that is about uh, an orange tree. The show was called Botanica and it, felt, and it was done in relation to the garden of the gallery. This was the second space we would have there near the second one, the first one. Next, please. And uh, the artist presented like uh, all works that would be explicitly related to the notion of of gardens. So we say here you can see a plant installation that the artist did with plants from the city, but she was interest, he was interested in color theory and explicitly the color theory by uh, Ludwig uh, by Wittgenstein that he did in relation to his garden in Vienna. So he would then uh, 
express it again, like translate it in, into like plants from different places. Next, please. Is like the trajectory of a bee in a in a flower in a garden. Next, please. Or actually, like this piece refers to this like problem of like of this linguistic problem of like talking or having words for the color white and how do we see white in plants and how do we have like an almost infinite variety of like whiteness in different plants and different flowers in every city. Next, please. So after Spencer Finch in this space, uh, we presented the project that we had started to work with, with with the very first exhibition with Elena Damiani, the Peruvian arch ar artist and also trained as an architect. And she did a new body of work with all Mexican minerals, so to say. Here on the center, you can see uh, a, a work with like black marble again, and on the left side, a work with volcanic stone. Next, please. So the work Transits and Occultations is like a, a, a stone translation of NASA photographs of different like uh, transit and occultations of the moon and the sun creating eclipses. So it's different versions of uh, reading the sun, the earth, and the moon. Exactly. So you can see, for example, here in the left stone, the trace the the white stripes of the of the black marble that are also then referred to other movements of of the earth that kind of have another another time. Next, please. This work is done with like volcanic stone from the Valley of Mexico, which then again refers to these um, geological processes. But it's actually also like a uh, a diagrammatic representation of the movements of the orbits of the three moons of Pluton that are extremely irregular with uh, different stones. And next, please. Here you can see the, the very explicit reference to Sergio Camargo, to the Brazilian modernist. Next, please. And actually, right before the pandemic started, we were able to do our last exhibition uh, live that was to present uh, the Swedish, the young Swedish painter Paul Fegeschel in Mexico for the first time. He's maybe one of the most significant young Swedish painter or the most in, at the moment. He works with monochromatic uh, painting mostly, but referring to like uh, perception and landscape and landscape painting. In this case, we can see like the, uh, a part of the curvature of the earth. So it would be like an, an horizon, so to say. It would also reference the sea and also to painting itself, seeing all, each brush, brush stroke very clearly. Next, please. So the show was called Geopoetics and it also referred to this notion of infinity or the infinity of of color perception in this uh, like painting on the left where there's this it's done with a spray can and it, it kind of like rains with all these like uh, infinity of like dots in the canvas. Next please. So here you see another painting by him a new work. Next please. And in dialogue with Paul Fegeschel I felt it was very uh, compelling in this case to like bring a uh, new work by Mexico City based artist Jimena Garrido Leca, which is this light installation. Next please. And this work actually makes is a reference or a like a visual meditation ar of, around the Inca god Ilapa, which is the god of rain and thunder and lightning. And according to Inca mythology, this god, like rain would happen because this god would get angry and would destroy his like ceramic uh, bucket of water, uh, full of water, and the, the explosion would create the sound of thunder, and then the, the, the energy would create light, and then water would come afterwards. In this uh, work, the artist like worked with traditional ceramics that she then destroyed and then like restored back together. And all the um, 
all the cabling is linked to a solar panel outside the gallery space. So it's only, there's only light when there's direct, sun, direct sunlight hitting the solar panel. Next, please. So you can see this, that the solar panel is also a part of the garden or the porch of the gallery. So we could kind of like constantly engage between also the inside and the outside. Next, please. Actually, I wanted to also give like a sneak peek of the next stage of the gallery where like we found uh, a very like uh, powerful new space, like, a, like an old storage that we took during the pandemic. And we took the chance of the pandemic to kind of establish more permanently the gallery in the city, so to say, by like taking such a space and renovating it with um, the young Mexican architect, Frida Escobedo. And actually, the process of renovating the building has become a kind of like organically the subject of, the, of our inaugural exhibition of the new space that is going to be the 3rd of December. And I can now give you a little bit of a, a glimpse of that. Next, please. So Frida Escobedo is an architect that is also a researcher and a researcher based on the on Mexican modernism in architecture and its decay and its uh, uh, like current role in the urban in the urban space. So she's been also like teaching and an author and her master thesis actually was based kind of like concretized in a more like in a conceptual artwork that consists in this 21 glass window from an anonymously produced modernist building in Mexico City that is a, nowadays a derelict, like a ruin almost, but half alive with like a, like a 24, 24-7, like a, like a 7-Eleven shop, like there's squatters in it. And the artists decided like uh, bought part of the windows and exchanged them for new ones. And by exhibiting the, the windows, one can see the traces of the history of the building that kind of like, uh, kind of like resemble the history of Mexico City and 60s architecture. So they are all like all like monochrome paintings, so to say, done by, by the contingencies of society. Next, please. And we invited the artists again, as we did with Elena Damian in the beginning, to select works from the collection of the gallery or the, uh, and the artist decided to introduce in, in her work like this painting by a Japanese conceptual artist on Kawara. Like, is this is from this series today, where the artist would paint every day, like one single painting with a date, and then like uh, box it with like a newspaper from the day. And the series can, this notion of marking every day would kind of resonate with her own work. Next, please. And actually the third work of the, of the exhibition for the new space would be also about the passing of time, so to say, but in a more uh, direct way related to Mexico City. And the artist decided to show a work by Francis Alitz that is called Sun Path, Mexico City, 20th of May, 99, uh, 433 PM. And the work was like a performance that happened in the, in the main square of Mexico City in the Zocalo where a group of people would be following the shape of the pole of the great mast of the great flag of Mexico during a whole day. And the, the pole all of a sudden will would like uh, work as like a sun clock. And this work would kind of like also mark like how movement in space is like has all these like uh, layers of like the everyday, the history of the of the site, but also aligned to the movement of the earth around the sun. And actually, to kind of like um, as a as an as an ending note, circling back with the with introduction, I want I'm very happy to also introduce that we're we're preparing like a, an exhibition with Stanley Whitney in Mexico City like the next next year, next season. And that will be something that, we, that I hope I can share with you sometime soon. And please don't hesitate to
to ask any question that you might have about the project. I, I said thank you so much, Tony. That was amazing. I, I cannot thank Stanley enough for bringing you to our attention and um, these beautiful projects. Thank you so much for um, the sensitivity and thoughtfulness that you had to have um, put into play to, to create this presentation. It's just stunning. And um, I'm giving people time to form questions because um, if they're like me, I was desperately trying to take notes but not wanting to miss one second of whatever was showing up on the screen. So. Um, I will start with just one thing uh, in particular, a very specific thing, which I didn't catch, and I've got to go back to um, June Crespo, is that correct, the mm -hmm. artist? Um, you mentioned something about um, the uh, representation of the horizontal in that work, mm -hmm. maybe versus the, uh, the vertical. There's something about... Um, I don't, I, I apologize because I, I was desperately trying to get that down. Mm -hmm. and, and also the philosopher that um, mm -hmm. June was referencing, I missed that as well. And that's just the worst way to get you started, having you have to climb back through your notes. That's so <laughs> No, no, no. no. <laughs> um, so... Uh, the artist is from Bilbao, where there's a very strong uh, 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 tradition of psychoanalytical thinking in the art school, because there's this professor at art, the art school that has been extremely influential to many uh, young artists since, may, since the last 10, 20 years. And especially one of us, so he's like an expert on Lacan. Oh, okay, Lacan. I but, the artist herself, Yune Crespo, she's very interested in the anthropologist and psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis that is called Gil, Gilbert, Gilbert Durand. Durand, okay. Durand. And he has these notions of, of um, noct nocturn nocturnal regime and, and data, daily regime. And he would relate it to anthropology and like further elaborate uh, and in a way that the artist found very uh, compelling to, to her own understanding of sculpture and understanding sculpture as presences or bodies and also with like um, notions of, uh, of gender, so to say, and sexuality. Hmm. Okay, I'm definitely going to have to do plow deeper into that work. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question here from one of our participants. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say it's Greg Abanez, um, who uh, hit the question is, can you elaborate on the critique of the representation of indigenous art artifacts in the Museo Anthropology, or the Museum of Anthropology? And I'm, because I can't pronounce it in Spanish. <laughs> The Anthropological Museum has uh, has like the first floor is the show is the the presentation of the collection, and the first or the second floor is uh, it shows more an ethnological art called in the museum, and in Mexico there is a very strong line of critique to this, especially to the uh, second floor, where there is like a lot of representation of different indigenous people, and it was conceived by the architect and. So the history is that Pedro Ramirez Vázquez invited uh, different indigenous, uh, the most important indigenous uh, collectives to build their own uh, architecture inside the museum. So they, yeah. so they would be then displayed in like wax uh, figures, like one on one. They would be there like uh, textiles, or saying like uh, folk art or ethnographic art. And then they would, there would be like uh, a lot of architecture like done in 1963 and 64 inside the museum, which right. a lot of like, make, like there's a, a line of thought in Mexico that finds it very extremely problematic, but especially the artists were very interested in the fact that the artist is, the architect is very well known for his uh, monument, like his brutalist architecture being extremely monumental. But actually they would argue that he's a master of like, 
commissioning one-on-one -on -one, like architecture. Mm. And also Pedro Ramirez Vasquez did the did two times like a miniature version of the history of Mexican architecture in Tijuana and in Seville. So he was also uh, depicting like Mexican architecture like in a in, min in miniature. And that's like the dialogue that they're having the between his more the three scales like the mini the one the one one on one and the macro oh that's very interesting um so there's this another question about architecture in particular um it's by jay uh, dodds he's asking the architect frida escovedo um mm -hmm. Uh, can we? Can you give a little bit more of her history? What else has she done? Anything nationally? So actually, she became extremely famous love, like a year and a half ago because she did the pavilion of the Serpentine Gallery in London. So it's this temporary pavilion that she produced, and her work very often refers to like a vernacular Mexican architecture and in a modernist kind of like fashion, so to say, and. She also did in Mexico very famously the um, the renovation of the studio of the painter Siqueiros in Cuernavaca. So she created, she did the architecture of this art center with uh, an element that is called uh, celosia, which would be like a grid, so to say, that that would divide one space with the other and would let the sunlight in. So to say, so that would be like maybe a landmark of her architecture. Uh, she's been teaching at Harvard for several years mm -hmm. and she has done also like uh, other works relating to the to an, an urban plan in the south of Mexico City called La Ruta de la Amistad, the root of friendship where like that is dotted with many sculptures that are also in decay a little bit. So she researched the history of these sculptures and did like urban plan and then exhibited, did like um, versions of the skeletons of some of the sculptures, for example. I'm so interested in her. I love, I love that um, you that her renovating that space turned into, in fact, the the mm -hmm. subject of the first exhibition. That's such a, that's just such a that speaks so highly of the gallery and kind of the organic, um, really sensitive response responsive way of curating. I love that. Um, I want to apologize for the last um, participant who gave, who questioned, I, Jay is female and I said he, I apologize for that, Jay. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm starting to put names with faces, but um, okay, so, so that I don't make that um, mistake again, somebody is asking a question anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> We have heard that uh, AMLO is reducing arts funding dramatically. Um, is this true and what are your thoughts? This is absolutely like true. We're working closely with several museums. Actually, Sarah Crowner will have a, an important exhibition at the Puebla Amparo Museum. We're also, like also Helen Mira will have an exhibition in the Museum of Guadalajara, the MAS, the MAS of Sapopan, and we're in close dialogue also with the Museo Tamayo for now a group show where an artist of us is participating. And there's, it's a, it's a reality that there's been like cuts of almost like three quarters of the budget of 2020. And even the resting, the rest have, has, it's just, yeah, it's very difficult to work in that circumstances, especially in the public sphere. So there's like a, a, a necessity to like build bridges between the private and the public and foundations that have been very traditional, very like supportive traditionally in Mexico, such as the Museo Tamayo itself or the Humex Museum or the Amparo Museums are becoming uh, kind of like even more needed these days. Yeah. Oh, um, okay, um, a question from Elena. Um, is there an opening date for the next exhibition in the new space? Um, and she's asking um, who will um, be inaugurating it? And then she says, Frida Escobedo, Escobedo um, which that's my understanding, or a group exhibition. And um, she 
apologizes if you've already covered this, but I think it's a good question. So it will be Frida Escobedo, Francis Alice, and Onkawara, curated by Frida. I love that. It will be the, th the third, like December 3rd. December 3rd. Oh, man. Mm. <laughs> Travel December 3rd. Um, okay. Um, and, there, and there was a thank you for that from Elena. Um, this um, this is amazing, Tony. I I I, I cannot wait for um, the pandemic to free us so that you can come come here in person. Mm -hmm. I want to do this again, mm -hmm. but in person. Um, nevertheless, I do like this format. I so appreciate that Stanley um, had the wherewithal to recommend you. You were the perfect person, and I just love how much we got in this first uh, presentation in this format, just how rich it was because um, as a curator and a director of the gallery, you, you shared so much. Um, yeah. Oh, I, here's one other question. Uh, Devin asked, um, oh, <laughs> Devin says, really great, everybody, exclamation mark. So I, I guess that's a statement, not a question, but thank you so much, Tony. And thank you to everybody who showed up tonight. Um, I guess if you have the stomach for it or you're so inclined, you can go watch the uh, U.S. presidential um, debate. <laughs> Otherwise, um, go have a glass of wine or whatever is your um, pleasure. And Tony, thank you again. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, John, for making this possible. Um, everybody come back next week um, for Candace uh, Williams, who is um, has been invited by the artist Alejandro Cesarco. Um, yeah, I think that every week is just going to blow your socks off, so don't miss it. And Tony, maybe you can join us again. You're welcome to come. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, everybody.